So I'm going to talk to you tonight about this idea of active citizenship as an answer to the education crisis. Um, and the, my starting position is, is Peter Block, who said that you change the world one conversation and one room at a time. And then the question comes, which one? The one I'm in right now. So I have an expectation of a world-changing conversation. Helderberg and Somerset West will never, ever be the same again as a result of this conversation. And if we can't make that happen, if we can't change the whole fabric of the society um, as a result of this conversation in, you know, tonight, then I don't know how you would ever do it. So we have to live in the, in the kind of hope that this is a very significant conversation for all of us and for this whole community. <clears throat> so let me just check whether there's anybody in this room who's not concerned about education. Clearly a well-educated group and they know what they're talking about. So I'm going to just talk, to get us all on the same page, because the reality is, as those of you who have children in this school have, do live in a bit of a bubble, um, those of you who come from other parts of the world know maybe a little bit more, but I just think it's important for us to get on the same page with regard to the state of the nation right now. Uh, Chris, um, Erin, I said, you know, you need to do bad cop, good cop. So can you not get someone else to do this piece and then you can come and do the solution? So I'm training him. Next time he's going to do the, this is how bad things are, and then I'll do the, here's solution. But before, we, you know, while he's not there yet, I need to do both. <laughs> uh, Professor Brian O'Connell and I did a presentation at the, the Actuarial Society conference the other day, and he's very generous, and he's blessing the next generation. So... He did the presentation, he tell, here's how bad things are, and then he to turn, turned to me and said, and now I'm going to sit down and she's going to have the answer. And it was so wonderful to step into that moment, but it will come. Six reasons why education has to be a national priority, I believe. One is, uh, many of you will have seen this, the World Economic Forum Global Competitiveness Report came out last year in October. South Africa is now number 140 out of 144 countries for the quality of our education. <laughs> we're not we're not right at the bottom anymore. We actually this is the this is the worst we've ever been. Yeah. We 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 were some, but this is the worst we've ever been. Um, and this these slides are available on the website, so you don't have to sit here and make lots of notes. We'll just give it to you. <clears throat> Second reason is that we've got about twenty five thousand schools in South Africa. Twenty thousand of those are deemed to be failing. Now the difference. I did a presentation the other day, and there were a whole bunch of Canadians and you people from America, and so they said, um, well, we, that's the same in, in Canada. I said, no, 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 can we just talk about the definition of failing? When we say our, our schools are failing, children cannot read at grade level in our schools. When the Americans say that the schools are failing, it's because they're not equipped for the 21st century, you know, all these wonderful things that you're trying to do here at Somerset um, House. So 80% of our schools are deemed to be failing. And and for a number of reasons. The third reason why we should cons be concerned is that we have, um, on average, a million children coming into grade one every year. Of that million, only 500,000 make it to matric. So 500,000 children are fall somewhere along the line, just escape the system. And of the 500,000 that make it to matric, only 200,000 will leave matric with a qualification that will enable them to live an economically sustainable life. That means that we are adding 800,000 young people to this pool of angry and disillusioned youth every year. And you and I both know what the risk is of that. So I'm not just doing this because it's altruistic. I'm doing it because I know that those kids are going to end up in my bedroom if I don't do something about this, if we don't do something about it. So there's a real, very practical reason why this is important and we need to get involved. <clears throat> the fourth reason, and this is something that really shocked me when I he heard it, we had a meeting with the um, a Deputy Director General from the Department of Basic Education, and she said to us that the department's latest assessment is that 80% of the children in grade five cannot read at grade level and will probably never be able to. Now, if you can't read at grade level in grade five, you are not going to make it to matric and pass matric well because you've, you, you're behind forever. And if you talk to any of our principals on the Cape Flats, they say the problem with our grade eights and grade nines is if you cannot read at grade level, you cannot learn what those teachers are trying to teach you, and so you are forever bored, and then you get in trouble, and then, you, then that's when we have a problem with truancy and drugs and all those things. 
So this is a significant, significant challenge for us as a nation. And I honestly believe that if we're going to change education, we have to look at grade three literacy, and we have to get that to 90%. So then maybe that's the first KPI for this piece of work, is can we get grade three literacy in the Helderberg Basin to 90%? Why are we accepting the current reality, which must be something like 35 or 40% of grade threes can read at grade level in this, in this whole area? And then the fifth reason is something that came out last year, is that we now number 62 out of 62 for maths and science. So we, we kind of, we've done the baseline, we don't have to do any more surveys, we know exactly how bad things are. Now we need to get up, and, and we need to, and that's the challenge, is that not many people know exactly how we're going to do that. And then the last reason is a, is a pre presentation that I see, that I saw done by Professor Brian O'Connell a few years ago where he, it's a database, and you, you ask this database information. So the first thing you say is, show the continents to scale, according to land mass, and that's what it looks like. Then he says, show us the incidence of primary education, and that's what it looks like. Now you, you can still recognize South Africa, you can still see where we are in Africa. Secondary education, the picture is changing slightly. Tertiary education, now this is where we see what the problem is. Science research new patents, just about gone. Books borrowed as a proxy for learning. Our kids are not reading, they don't have access to books, they don't develop a love for reading because they don't, it's just never been part of the culture. And then lastly, and this is where the CEOs now suddenly take lots of notice, and the CFOs and all these people who are kind of in the business of making money. It's going to be a real stretch for us to continue to make money in this country and, and build wealth if we don't deal with this dr dramatic issue within 20,000 20, of our schools. So there are 12, 14 million children in our school system today. And the days of thinking, well, I'm okay, my kids are okay because they're in this wonderful bubble called Somerset House is long gone. And I've got Arthur Preston here from Alcana, and we had exactly the same conversation because parents at Alcana should be as worried as parents in Cryfontaine because you may be able to protect those kids until they're in grade 12, and then they're going to be going into the real world, and the real world doesn't look like this. And that's going to be a major shock, and as Arthur will talk to you later about, is if we continue to... to develop the 20%, 20% will just become a, a target because they will have so much more and will just continue to create this huge gap between the haves and the have-nots. So it's not an option. It's not, it's not something that we can even contemplate. <coughs> so we are, we, I talked about millions of angry and disillusioned youth. Um, this morning I was at the PESA, which is this industry body that is now trying to get investors to bring people to South Africa. This is one of their big concerns, is when they talk to investors about bringing outsourcing to South Africa, the investors are concerned about the high level of systemic risk in our country. It's what the people at DeVos is concerned about. It's something we should all be concerned about. And the question is, how do we reduce that? So I believe education has to be a national priority. And I want to do a quick um, comparison. Can you remember when we, when we had the World Cup in 2010? how all of us were involved in some way, shape, or form. Every one of us, we were all had yellow jerseys. We all went to the fan parks. We bought at least one or two tickets. We you know, were nice to the foreigners when they arrived. We had stuff on our wing mirrors. We were in there. All of us were in there. With education, we've kind of taken a stance that says, you know what's really not my problem. Actually, I'm fine because my kids are in you know, privileged school. Um, and we've been sitting on the sidelines complaining and moaning and bewailing, and if only we can have a better education to minister, everything will be fine. Uh, but we're not engaged. So what if, what if education was as important as hosting a World Cup? How would we all show up differently? What would we do differently? So the question is, what are we going to do? And we have lots of options. One option is we can do uh, what you have all experienced at the Bri. We can get very depressed. Yeah? You know that kind of bad things are? Anybody recognize that experience? Second thing we can do is we can pack our bag. Now, I just want to say to you, I have lived in the UK for a long time. Perth in, Perth in New Zealand is very boring. The UK is going through some really difficult times. Vancouver is very cold. Um, I, don't, I, I know for me this is not an option, and I can say that because I'm a homecomer. Now, if you were thinking about doing this, I just want you to go and 
go at the end of December holiday to the airport and just watch the pain as the grandparents have to say goodbye to the grandchildren who came to visit. It's horrible, it's absolutely horrible. And the frightening piece here is that I've brought my kids back. I don't want them to go and live in Vancouver or Canada because that's the third option is we can make lots and lots of money and have our kids in private schools, but then we're going to have to continue to make lots of money because then our kids are going to go and live in Vancouver and Canada and, you know, and then we're going to, or Vancouver and Perth, and we're going to have to travel to them and it's going to be horrible to be so far away from them. So I don't want to, that's not an option for me. The, the other thing we can do is we can do something that we know what to do well. We can wait, continue to wait. Now there's a wonderful movie that came out in the US and it was made by the same guy who made Inconvenient Truth, a guy called Davis Guggenheim. And Guggenheim found that in America, people have known for 50 years that the education system is failing children in America. And for 50 years, I've been waiting for Superman to come and fix it. And Guggenheim thought it's his responsibility to deliver the message to the American public that Superman is a fictional character. He's not coming. Now what? So that's our message as well. You know, even however wonderful jo Jonathan Janssen is, he's not the answer. Mampela Rampela, not the answer. The answer isn't going to come from some miraculous, you know, magic wand or some hero, superhero. The an answer has to come from somewhere else. And here's the question we have to ask ourselves is, what if we are being asked to be the change we want to see in the world? What if it's us? What if the answer is us? Which is a horribly uncomfortable question, but that's what I'm going to ask you to consider. Because it is our country and our future and our children. And this was a v defining moment for me one day when I was kind of complaining. And I said, you know, my kids are in Kenridge and it's a fabulous school. It's a government school, but it's a wonderful school. And all those kids. And as I was saying that, Peter Block got really irritated with me. And he turned to me and he said, Louise. And he kind of you know, knocked the, fl the glass over on the table. He said, aren't they all your children? And so now I'm coming to you as the mother of 14 million children. People do say you've got your body, body back quite quickly. I know. But it's a different conversation for me when I talk to a principal and said, how many of my kids are in your school? Because they're all our children. None of us can walk away and say, well, my children goes to Chris's school, so I'm happy. I'm, you know, I'm fine. We're not fine because it's not fine for the, for the majority of the 14 million children. <coughs> So what are we all sitting here say, so, okay, okay, you've talked to us now about how bad things are. Tell us what we can do, yeah? That's what you now want to know? I'll tell you in a minute. I want to go back to this thing. And I'm seeing in front of me a whole bunch of people from business. Can I just see who, are, who, are, who would class, classify themselves as business people? They work in kind of corporate South Africa. I love this. And we've got some lawyers and other wonderful people here as well. So remember that report, 140 out of 144? That same report has South Africa as number one in the world for the quality of our auditing and reporting standards. Number two in the world for the availability of financial markets. We have the knowledge and skills in South Africa to fix this issue. It's just unevenly distributed, like just about everything else. We have been investing in the private sector over the last few decades, and we've not been investing in the government, in the public sector. So it's as easy as that. So which means it's really easy to fix. So the question we have to ask ourselves, and I'm specifically talking to all these business people, what if all of us, all of us in business, have a huge amount of knowledge and understanding about leading change? I saw Marieke here earlier. Marieke has been teaching people about leading change. I've been teaching people about leading change. There are a whole bunch of people in the room who are in the business of teaching at business schools and at colleges and training centers. So we, we have been train, training all these amazing business leaders. What if we could somehow tap into that resource pool that we as a country have created over the last few years in dealing with this crisis? It would be a completely out of the box idea, I get it, but it's a real possibility that we should consider. So the proposal that I'm bringing to you tonight is a partnership between business, government and civil society. And we are already seeing that this partnership is leading to significantly improved education outcomes in the schools where we're working. But I do have a warning here. And the warning is that if you stay, you are going to be on the hook. So here's what I've discovered. I'm a homecomer, as I said earlier. I brought my two beautiful daughters back. They don't look like that anymore. They're now kind of feisty teenagers. But that's just when they were kind of, you know, I could still get them in the same picture in the same 
outfit and all that stuff. And the reality that, that hit me one day, which is a real difficult thing for me to get my head around, is that these two kids, in 10 years' time, when this thing goes horribly pear-shaped, because we've got about a decade before it's going to go horribly pear-shaped, when it does go horribly pear-shaped, these two kids will be able to look at me and say, Mum, you knew. What did you do? And if you stay in this room tonight, you're going to know too, which means that you're going to be on the hook. Now, this is the moment where you get that phone call and you quickly have to run and you kind of have to find a reason why you can't stay. Because if you're going to stay, you're on the hook and then we're going to have to have a conversation with you about what are you going to do. So anybody wants to leave now? This is your moment now? Good. See? True leaders in this room, clearly. So we have a dream, which is a completely ridiculous dream. We get it. You know, everybody I talk to tell me how impossible this is. That we want to see quality education for all children in South Africa by 2022. So we've got a date. And the reason why we have a date is that if we're not going to kind of get our heads around this now, we're going to keep thinking it's okay, we can do it yet next year. And every year we'll add 800,000 children to the gutters of this country. And, and that will just lead to the systemic risk and we're just going to, so we have to have a very audacious goal. Now, I don't know whether any of you have seen the Apple ad that says, here's to the crazy people, because it's only the really crazy people who believe that they can change the world and then actually do. So we're part of that. So we want to invite you to be really, really, really crazy and, and, and go into the world and, you know, buy yourself a, a bracelet and show the world how crazy you are because quality education for all children in South Africa by 2022 is the dream. So we have to start by saying, well, how do we do that, for goodness sake? Stop with the talking about this. Tell us how to do it. 20,000 failing schools, how are we going to change that? We, that's, this is actually a, a quite surprisingly challenging question, because for 18 years, we have been thinking that we're going to change education by what happens in Pretoria. Five curriculum changes in the last 18 years. We've not seen education go up in one you know, way. Um, it's just the quality has just gone down all the way. Um, so it's not going to happen from Pretoria. And then the next dream was that it will happen from Cape Town. So we'll just lob it over the fence to Cape Town, and then Cape Town miraculously is going to sort it out, and it's going to be fine. It's not being fine. The DA, even the DA doesn't have this one sorted. We have to know how we change 20, a system with 20,000 school system. And this is the conversation we had earlier. I feel incredibly privileged because I had the opportunity to study for my doctorate studies um, how do you change a large-scale complex social change. How do you lead change in a large scale complex system? And this is how you do it, one school at a time. So what we need to do is we need to launch 20,000 change projects. Now, if I say that to all these business leaders, they go, well, well, that's easy. We do that all the time. It's not a problem. If you've got a good you know, project management system and a good program office, you can do that. But the, difference, the, the issue is that we can't do it with the current level of skill set and resources in our system. We somehow need to bolster that. So we came up with this idea of business leaders and principals being in a co, what we call a co-learning and co-action partnership. That's my partner, Ridwan Samadin from the Grassy Park, Cape Flats. Uh, he's changed my life in um, a thousand ways because I have learned more from him than I've learned from doing an MBA and a doctorate and many leadership development courses. My being a partner for Possibility for Ridwan Samadin has been the most impactful leadership development program process I've ever been. And that was when we realized that here's an opportunity. Because imagine if our business leaders could learn about leadership, because they all have budget and have to learn about leadership, in our schools, while at the same time contributing to positive social change. So now, it, now it's becoming an innovation. So I want to say to you that this is a uniquely South African innovation that the world is now getting, I'm just going off to the States to go and talk about it, because people from around the world are noticing that something special is happening here, and they want to, they want to import what we're doing in South Africa into their countries. We have now 89 business leaders working with 89 principals. At the end of this week will we'll be, I think we're on to 105, because we're launching two more leadership circles around the country. And we want to launch a leadership circle here in Somerset West. Um, and we want Somerset House to be the, what we call a resource school that will be uh, hosting some of these conversations and we'll be tapping into Chris as a resource to help us do that. But imagine if you guys could somehow come together to take responsibility to lead change in 10 schools in the way that these business leaders have been doing across the country. Uh, 
quickly want to tell you, well, so just a little bit about who at the moment are interested in this. We are supported by an amazing group of thought leaders. Um, Professor Brian O'Connell is our patron. Uh, Dr. Mampella Rampella has been one of those very first people who contributed to our thinking when we developed this. Uh, Professor Jonathan Janssen has been actively involved in and has been blessed, blessing us. Uh, Dr. Professor John Volmink, and then uh, Pete Laban is our chairman, for those of you who may know Pete. And we have this joy of working with amazing principals. So we've got, I had to try and get as many of them on the screen. Uh, but we work very closely with SAPA, South African Principals Association, and the Governing Body Foundation in what we're doing. So that's the kind of quick credibility out of the way. We, we are not um, fly-by-nighters. We've really done our homework to get the right people involved in this program. Uh, sorry, and it is enabled by a registered not-for-profit and a public benefit organization. So where do we start? Well, firstly, for all of those of you who lead change, we know that we have to start by looking at what is the root cause. So we have to not, we can't just continue to put elastoplasm, because, you know, a lot of what happens in this country at the moment is some clever person sits in a corporate office and decides, well, I think what these people need is a new computer lab. So then we go and implement a new computer lab. And then a year later we go there and the computer lab's not actually being in use because it's not what that community needed or wanted or actually it's just a, it's, it's an act of judgment to be these charitable acts rather than working with the community in a respectful way. So we have to do root cause analysis. Now what's coming now, this next slide, is, is the gospel according to Luis van Rijn. You know, because somewhere along the line you have to stick your neck out. So I've been sticking my neck out and I've done this presentation now to, hunt, to I mean, Dozens of thousands of people. And um, there's a, and I haven't had one person who's come to me and said, actually, you've got it wrong. So I'm hoping that tonight might be the night. So I really want to invite you to challenge this hard. But I believe that we've got two main reasons why we are where we are. Firstly, the officials who are being asked to lead this major change simply don't have the knowledge and skills about how to lead large scale complex social change. Angie is a teacher. I believe that she was a fabulous teacher, Angie Masheka, but she's a teacher. She wasn't ever trained in how to lead large scale complex social change. So why are we surprised when it's not working? And if you go and talk to the people in her team, most of them were, you know, teachers who came up the ranks and, and, and now they're in these, they have these portfolios and somehow miraculously they have to make change happen and they have no idea. Now is there anybody who disagrees with us? Anybody who's seen a you know, real insightful understanding of large scale complex social change in the Department of Education? That's a worry. So the second one, and you can't see what, the screen, what this says, but this is an article, some of you may know Nick Spols, he's from the University of Stellenbosch. He wrote an article in Mail and Guardian recently, and he said, at the heart of the failure of our education system is the chasm between policy and implementation. Stuff gets developed in Pretoria, lobbed over the fence to Cape Town, lobbed over the fence from Cape Town to Somerset West, and there isn't an understanding about how to implement that. And so someone from the World Bank said to me recently, you in South Africa have some of the best policies ever. You just haven't got a clue about how to implement it. Would you, would you agree with that? So what we need is two things. We need knowledge of how to lead logical complex social change, and we need local implementation capacity. Now, I'm letting you off the hook for the first one, because we've got enough people now who really understand this world. But what we need you for is for that second one. We need you to help with local implementation capacity in these schools around, um, in, in the, the Helderberg Basin. So here's a gift, and I'm giving you this as a gift, because for, for years and years and years, I made lots of money by teaching this stuff and kind of Propriety IP and you have to come and then I'm going to give you this and then you go away and you say that you've got it from us. I'm now giving it away as, as quickly and that we could possibly give it away because this is the issue that we have to work with, this next one. Is that there are six phases of change in any kind of change, whether it's Chris leading change here at Somerset House or whether it's, you know, the NetBank person leading change at NetBank or the old mutual person. There are always, always in every change process, six phases of change. And the first phase is the readiness phase. And you cannot make progress in your change initiative if you've not built, built readiness. The second phase is that you have to do a baseline assessment. Because when people say, oh no, no, you have to do baseline. No, you cannot do baseline assessment first because there's no trust. 
And you know what? Every school principal in South Africa have been beaten over their heads with data that they shared too early, where there wasn't enough trust. So they've learned their lesson. They're not going to share with you what really goes on in those schools until they can trust that they're not going to help use it against you. And anybody who wants to disagree with me, come and talk to me later. I've got hundreds of stories. The third level is, the third phase of change is to co-create a vision. I mean, I specifically talk about co-creation, so that's about getting the community involved and getting a, enough of the stakeholders involved in that school to say, here's what we want to achieve in this school. As an example, at Kanamea Primary, we identified our vision, or we crafted the vision that says that we want to be the school of choice in the Grassy Park community. Now, that's an easy enough vision that even I can remember. So I can walk around every conversation I say to Ridwan, my partner, now, is this going to help us become the school of choice in Grassy Park? And if the answer is not yes, then we're not going to do it. We're going to stop doing some of the stuff that everybody wants to kind of come and do at the school. Then you develop a strategy and plan, and then, then the fifth phase is to implement and monitor. And here's the critical piece, is that 90% of activities in education in South Africa happens at that phase. People say, oh, well, we've got the answer. It has to be science, maths and science workshops. But actually, if there isn't a toilet at a school, then a maths and science workshop is just going to irritate everybody. So let's, let's work with the community and find out what the community wants by taking through, going through this process and then implement what it is that that community needs rather than what we, the well-meaning people, want to do. I spoke with Alan Winder this afternoon and he has a figure that scares the living daylight out. He says that I thought it's 6.6 .6 billion, but he says it's 26 billion rand from CSI money is being spent on, on kind of well-meaning initiatives. And he says most of these initiatives is the pet project of the CEO's wife. It's not the real stuff. It's just what the CEO's wife wants to do with this 26 billion rand. Now, that's, that's very scary. Because what happens is that we're not seeing the sustainable impact as a result of the, you know, doing something on level five when we've not done level one, level two, level three. So that's what, we, what we're very committed to do in our project is to start at level one. And this is where you all, again, play a role. So quickly, I want to tell you how this works. So firstly, we've discovered through working with many principals that none of our principals, or let me say a very small percentage of our principals, are being, are, have been equipped for their tasks. So let's just do the... I saw someone from Alt Mutual. Is there a person from NetBank in the room? Because they're a client of mine. I can talk about NetBank. Okay, Alt Mutual. There no, was definitely an Alt Mutual person. Now, if you're a, a manager at Alt Mutual, you would get, on average, about 10 days of quality leadership and management development per year. Yeah? Ish. So if you're there for 10 years, then that means 100 days of high quality management and leadership development training. Now, if I ask that same question, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to put anybody on the spot, but if we ask that same question to the principals, so on, over the last 10 years, how many days of world-class management and leadership development training have you received? They'll say zero. If they're lucky, two days. But that's the kind of, you know, and now we, you're a fabulous leader, I can see that, but why do we think you need 100 days of training and the principal doesn't? It's, not, it's simply because your managers and your organization know that that's critical for the sustainable, for sustainability for, the organi for your organization and for your ability to continue to lead at high levels of complexity. So how dare we ask these principals who you all saw st stand up to lead without the basic um, equipment? So the, the principal from, from Cryfontein, let's just quickly, I'm going to ask you one question about this. So you have to run, you have to manage a budget, yeah? And I don't know him, so I'm taking a big risk here. But have you been sent on a high quality uh, finance for non-financial managers course? No. You know what happened to that principal? I'm going to tell his story, I don't know him. He was a teacher, great teacher. Then he got promoted to be a, a head of department. But there was none of this kind of, you know, moving from leading self to leading others nonsense. He just said, yes, you're now the head of department. And then one day he woke up and he became the deputy principal. Yeah? Any kind of special training to say what does it mean and what does that job mean and what do we expect of you? No, no, you just get a job title. And then the next thing he gets, now he's a principal. And you know what happens when you get a principal? You get a key. Now you get bunches of keys. <laughs> Lanyards full of keys. And you get 
the key to the safe and you get the budget and you get all this st stack of forms and you know what the principals have learned how to do? They copy last year. So there's a school improvement plan. I say, how does that develop? Well, we just copied last year. There's a budget. How did you get to that? We just added some numbers from last year. We've got, you know, sat here with our print. So that, you know, is there any way that you can, you know, tally up the debits? No, no, there's no debits and credits. We just fill in these forms and then we send it to head office and then we kind of have that off our back. How did... And then, then the principal say to us, you'll be seeing, she says, you'll be seeing a lot more corruption charges against principals because none of us have an idea what we're doing. Not because we're not fabulous people, but because we, as a society, have not been equipping our principals to do this really critically important task that we're asking them to do. Now, are you horrified by that? Because I've got enough principals in the room. Any principals want to dispute what I'm saying? I'm happy to be told I'm speaking nonsense here. Yes? Four-day induction for new principles. Okay, so life's going to be fine. In a year from now, we've done five, four days of induction. It's not fair. It's not fair. Because we not only are we asking them to be principles, we're asking them to lead a significant transformation. Because we're not happy with the 30% pass rate. We want it to be 100%. So that what we've said earlier is the biggest challenge. Now, the same principal, I mean, he's got a fabulous chairman of the governing body because she came with him tonight. Treasurer. <laughs> Treasurer. That's even better. But you know what? In the schools where, in, in Red One, in Kanamea Primary, when I first walked, go, went to that school and I said to Red One, okay, we're having an event tonight. Who's going to pack the chairs? He said, I'm packing the chairs. I said, well, who's cooking the food? I'm packing the food. Who's doing the budget? There's no budget. Who's... So Red One, if, if Chris needs help with his budget, he has a treasurer. If he needs help with his HR, he has someone who's on the HR committee. I met the legal guy. If there's a challenge, he speaks to the legal guy. It's so unfair. And what we've discovered is that the difference between schools that are failing and schools that are succeeding is simply the amount of resource available to the principal in the school that succeeds is just two, three times as much resources. In. Now, the other thing that's unfair here is Chris sits with you guys who show up when he invites you. Now, the principal in Cryfontaine, on the other hand, if he says, so I'm, my kids are at Kenridge Primary, and when, when, the, when the letter comes out, we need a parent who can help with that, nine out of ten times I get a note to say, we don't need you because we've got enough. If he says, we want some parents to come and help, how many parents show up? We don't send out those letters because we don't want to be embarrassed with them not showing up. Exactly. So, so can you hear that? Parents are not skilled, they're not literate, they're not going to show up. And apart from that, so what, how many teachers do you have at your school? So can, let's just get this right. 1,300 learners, 40 educators, one parent, one principal, and those 41 people are responsible for all these kids. Now we come to Somerset House. And I'm not going to ask you to do the exact numbers, but we have Chris, we have an amazing team of educators, we have an amazing governing body, we have parents who show up in their hundreds to come and be involved in the school. Actually, they would love you to not be so involved because you're a bit over the top. <laughs> so, I mean, it's just not fair. Life isn't fair. I talked to Arthur about parents who are too involved. So the biggest challenge is local implementation capacity. So we know that we need to do a better job of supporting and equipping our school principals. And you know who the best people is to do that? These people who we have been training. <laughs> so, careful. <laughs> so the best people to support our principals are people who have the knowledge and experience of leading organizational change. So this is the idea here, is that we want to link all these wonderful people, and if you've come tonight with one of these really experienced change leaders, nudge them at this point, we want to link them, and we want to give each of them the opportunity to work in partnership with a school principal and have a life-changing experience, because I promise you it is life-changing on every level.
If anybody thought they're going to come in and they're going to kind of come and help these principles, it's not quite how it works. Your life has changed in the process, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So we know that in any change project, change readiness is the most critical piece. So we ask, we give lots of guidance. We've learned that we have to give lots of guidance. We're not going to ask any business leader in the room to just kind of say, go and be, you know, become a partner. We're going to give you some guidance. And here's what we're going to teach you, guide you. Firstly, we want the, the school principles to come out of this victim state. And they're not in a victim state because they're bad people. They're in a victim state because it's the only way that they've been able to survive the avalanche of abuse that they're getting. Yeah? Avalanche of abuse. Because the abuse comes from every direction. It comes from the department, who comes all the way from the Premier, because the Premier has an objective to, you know, for, the, for 2014, and we, she's going to go to the polls, and things have to be sorted, and she gets really anxious, and then she talks to the district officials, and then the district officials gets really anxious, and then they start to shout at the principals and deliver the best, better outcomes. So I spoke to a principal, I said, wow, you've got much better um, results for your matrix than last year. How did you do it? He said, don't tell anybody, but we've just moved a whole bunch of the kids to math lit. Math, math lit. But we're being measured on, we have to get the results up. If that's the answer, then that's what we'll do. Western Cape principle. Um, and we need to move. So, and the other thing is they're being abused by teachers. They're being abused by everybody is on a principal's case. Every, every one of us have, you know, fix a few principles on our to-do list. Now, this program asks for these business leaders to show up with love and compassion and uh, to be willing to have high expectations, but to not do it in any, with any judgment or any criticism. And our principals are doing this, like literally you can see it, they go, and then they start to lead. And they lead with shining eyes and enthusiasm, and we are all in awe 95% of the time when we get the opportunity to work with these principals. It's, it is absolutely awe-inspiring to realize what gems we have in us principals at the moment. And this story that they all used us is just a story. That's a lie. They are amazing people who have just not had a chance to be supported in the way that we all are. The second thing is we then know that the principal have to have a team of educators around the school, around them. Now, Chris has that. I mean, I have to spend a little bit of time here, but you feel the sense of team cohesion at the school. In most of the schools where we go, you know why? Because there's never been any money to spend on team development. There's never been any capacity because we just focused on implementing CAPS. And that's where all the money goes, is to implement these big new projects. But what we've not been doing is we've not been spending time on bringing in some people to come and help with team cohesion. Now, here's the wonderful thing. If any of these business leaders become the school, the, the partner to the principal, and they don't know about team development, I tell you, they've got 10 other people in their, in their network who they can contact. So we then ask them to kind of get your network involved. And then lastly, capacity. Now, we talked about that earlier. Chris is not on his own in the school. He has a whole group of you who, are, who he can call on. And we need to make that happen in our schools in all over this Helderberg Basin because we cannot continue to have principals who feel completely overwhelmed. The key focus for us on that readiness phase is active citizenship. So when we say active citizenship, it's to kind of say, how can I be of assistance rather than standing back and waiting with my hands stretched out? And so we're moving away from parents kind of dumping their kids in grade one and picking them up in grade seven or 12 and then being disappointed that they don't, can't do it, to into new kinds of partnerships with parents where we're inviting parents into a partnership conversation with the teachers. And I know they under, they, they under-resourced and I know they don't have lots of money, and I know, but what we do know is that those parents have amazing gifts. So we're moving the conversation from a deficiency conversation to a gifts conversation. So the parents come and say, well, I can't pay my school fees because I don't have money. I say, great, but what, what are your gifts? Well, I can paint. Fabulous. On Friday, there's some painting happening. Can you come and paint? Or can you bring your, what are your, what are the gifts that you can share with the school? And we are seeing some amazing things happen. So that's part of what we are inviting people to do. So today, just to kind of get to the end of this part, is we've got 89 business leaders working with 89 principals. Uh, we are currently working in Johannesburg, Cape Town, Durban, and Stellenbosch. We'll soon be launching in, Stel in, in Somerset West, sorry, Bloemfontein, George, Nyssen, Somerset West, Hermanus, and East London. We have 
all of those companies are already involved, about 50 different organizations. Many of you will see your, the, the logos of your companies on there. And our vision is to have 2,000 business leaders working with 2,000 principals by 2017. Um, for those of you who are interested, and we can talk to you later about the details here, but just for those of you kind of sitting, well, maybe, I, maybe I'll consider it. Um, it's a world-class leadership development process that, that encompasses many of the things that we know is not covered when you go to Gibbs and GSB. And I, by the way, have cleared this with the business schools. I've been teaching at business schools, and we've brought the best of the... The, the fun stuff into this program and we've, we left the boring stuff on its own and, and we are saying to business schools, well, you know, if education is a national priority, then we're going to have to rethink how we do it for a few years. So it's a year-long program where we ask business leaders to be part of a community of practice. So here in Somerset West, there will be between eight and ten partners who will work together and the one and the principals will come and say, well, I don't know how to do this. And then the partner would say, well, I've, we've done this as our school and you'll keep sharing with each other. It's an amazing peer learning process. Um, there's some content, so we give you five books. There's some training, so people do five days of training, the business leader and the partner does this together. Uh, that we ask them to grapple with real stuff at the school, so the princi principal will say, well, you know what, we've got this discipline issue and I have no idea how to do it, and then the, the partner comes with all of their business knowledge and says, well, here's what we've done in that in area in the past. And then we bring, the, get this new kind of merging of ideas from the two different um, sectors. And then there's coaching and finally uh, reflection and sense making and a celebration event. So how it works is that there's a commitment of 16 hours over a year to meet these, to, to join these leadership circles, meetings. These five books that you're going to have to read. There's 40 hours of training. So one day time to think, two days flawless consulting, two days um, language of leadership, which you'll all find out is an amazing, amazing, amazing process. Uh, we ask the business leaders to spend about 40 hours over a period of 11 months at the school, practically being an available and, and of assistance to the, to the um, principal, the school management team, and the governing body. The business leader gets coaching by an accredited coach. Um, and then, and this whole thing is, is accredited by the University of the Western Cape as an NKF level six, sorry, five, yeah, NKF level six program. So you get all the skills, workplace skills, plan, um, points for that. And then the whole thing is lots and lots and lots, lots of PE points for what you're doing here. So the, but the point I want to, want to kind of end up, up with before we ask for questions is that what we've discovered is that on that screen, we're now talking specifically about the role of business. But there is a role for every single one of us to play. If you are part of a faith-based community, there's a particular whole job, you know, group of jobs that we want the faith-based communities to do. If you're an optometrist, we want you to come and test the kid's ears. If you are an audio, you know, sorry, an optometrist, an audiologist, <laughs> if that stuff. So if you can coach, uh, you know, come and be available as a coach in the afternoons. If you can, our kids are awake 5,800 hours a year. This is something we all need to pay attention to. Of that time, they only spend 1,200 at school. So that's 20% of their awake hours. Now for the kids who come to this school, that 20% is on top of the 4,600 hours that you as parents have been involved in. So my kids, the 4,600 hours is filled with you know, iPads and books and trips to the theater and movies and, you know, two educated parents and a whole series of things. So that 1,200 hours is only the cherry on the cake of the 4,600 hour cake that I've baked. That's what happens here at Somerset House. The kids in most of these squatter camps, the 4,600 hours, or even in most of the areas that I'm in, in, in some of the sub suburban areas where the parents are just not available, the 4,600 hours are not just empty, they're negative. Because that's when they have to deal with violence and drugs and gangs and you know emotional ab abuse and socioeconomic issues, all sorts of issues. So the 1,200 there's no foundation for the 1,200 hours. So we are going to have to look at how do we enrich the 4,600 hours? How do we shift how we think about the 4,600 hours? 
So I'm going to kind of pause at this point and hear from you whether anybody's got any questions. So I want to tell you, I want to end by telling you what I've learned from doing this, and then I'm going to hand over to Irene, who does a fabulous job of just doing a final call to action. So what I've learned from doing this, <clears throat> first thing I've learned is that the delivery vehicle of my expertise is my humanity. Now that's a big deal. Because for many years, I thought that I get stuff done because of the fact that I have, you know, degrees and job titles and smart clothes and smart cars. And now I've realized that when I show up to Kaname, they're not interested in any of that stuff. They don't want to know where I live. All they want to know is whether I'm going to continue to show up and whether I'm going to keep my promises. And whether I'm willing to show up with humanity rather than, than you know, my being full of all my knowledge and my skills and whether I'm willing to be interested in them, which is the second piece. As I've discovered what it means to be helpful. For many years, I thought what's being helpful is for me to tell you what I think. Because I got all my brownies points and all my gold stars from telling what I think. And in kind of my primary, I've discovered that what it means to be helpful is to replace help with curiosity. Because this help is just another form of colonialism. It's just another form of you, me telling you that I think I'm better than you, so I'm here to help you, you poor person. And actually that's demeaning and it's disrespectful. And who am I to believe that I know better um, than my principal in Grassy Park? The third thing I've discovered is what it means to collaborate across boundaries. Now, collaborating across boundaries is on every leadership course that I can, you know, that I've seen in the last 10 years but they all do it in the most safest, most comfortable way ways. And so here's where I'm inviting everybody to get out of their corporate offices, out of their air-conditioned offices, and go and spend some time in an environment that's very different from the world that you normally live in, and be, willing to, and be ready to have your, your life changed. So it's something that I, I cannot recommend it strongly enough because my life has been enriched by my in, involvement in the, the Grassy Park community in a way that I could never have envisaged. The fourth thing I've learned is something that um, is happened before my engagement at Kanamaya, but it's had a big impact on me. Um, and I think it's the only way why this has been possible. And it's a story that some of you may have heard, but it happened uh, in, in the UK. I was working um, in the design team for the BBC. We were doing the leadership development course for the BBC. And I was being what I thought was, a, I was demonstrating leadership. So there I was, and I had ideas, and I gave my input, and I was, you know, like full on, in your face. Do you get it? That's how I was. Now, I thought that's what leadership looked like, because that's what I was taught my whole life. Until at the end of the session, someone came to me and she said, would you mind if I gave you some feedback? Now, I don't know what happens to you in that moment, but that's a very scary moment for me was in a place of higher learning and you know so the only possible answer I could give was I would love to hear your feedback <laughs> even though I wanted to run a mile to which she responded let's go for a walk <laughs> so there we were walking down this beautiful little path and she said something that's changed my life and I think it's the only reason why I'm still here but what I've discovered is that this is at the heart of why we are where we are in this country she said, Louise, I need you to know what happens to me when you are so certain. And I realized that my enthusiasm, and, you know, what I thought was leadership, was experienced by her as certainty. I need you to know what happens to me when you are so certain. My voice goes completely quiet because there is no space in your certainty for my voice to be heard. And then she continued. And what I need you to do is to hold certainty a little more lightly so that there's space for my voice too. So what I've discovered at Kanama Primary is that this idea of leaders have to be certain and they have to give direction and they have to tell people what to do and they have to just, that's the old way of leadership. The new way of leadership is to create a space where every voice is heard. And what happens for our business leaders when they start to do this, they, they catch themselves being directive and then they go back to work and they said, oh my goodness, 
Oh my goodness, that's what I do here too. I'm always the one who tries to come up with all the answers and I'm not creating enough of a space for other people to discover the answer for themselves. And then the last thing I've learned is always, always difficult for me to talk about. I've done it many times, but it keeps choking me up. So I'm almost 50. For my entire life, I've been searching for validation and acceptance and love and appreciation. And I've done four degrees, and, and I know, now know, after lots of therapy, <laughs> that the reason why I've done it is every single time I believe that this time my dad's going to tell me that he's, pr that he's proud of me. And he's not done it. But you know, when I go to Kanama Primary, their eyes light up. Red one's eyes light up. The teachers storm out of their office and they come and give me a hug. So what I had to, I had to go to Kanama Primary to discover that who I am is enough. And I, I've just realized, I, I went through a really difficult week and I had to realize, I realized that, that I've forgotten this again. And that I needed to go back and today I was back there and I was reminded that who I am matters to that community at Kanama Primary. And I wish that for everybody. I wish for everybody to discover that who you are is a gift to the world. And maybe the best place for you to do that is to discover that at a school in the Helderberg area that's not full of resources like this one. 